The following message was preached at Gospel City Church, a church that seeks to cast a gospel net for the people of Kuala Lumpur. Yeah, good morning. Give me a second to set this up. Okay, I'm not as tall as Carl, but I still need, neither am I. <laughs> okay, internal GCC joke. Uh, good morning, my name is Man Hon. I'm one of the elders here at Gospel City Church. Um, delighted that all of you are here. We are in the middle of a series on Daniel, in the book of Daniel. We titled the theme thematically that God reigns. We are called to not compromise and not cover. All right? So today we are in Daniel chapter 8. Let me start. I introduced to someone I know. This guy received a high paying job offer before he even set for his final university exams. For 10 years, he progressed and was promoted in a career across a few countries. His income was tax free. He received every year cash paid holidays and on top of his income. Housing was paid, children's education was paid by the company. But in year 2000, he resigned to start a tech company that would change the world. He raised money, multiple millions, 30 over million uh, dollars from investors in Hong Kong, Japan, and some in Malaysia. Over the 10 years, he worked long hours, grueling long hours. But the product he created was way ahead of his time. The world was not ready to be changed. The internet wasn't ready. The company had high cash burn. To keep the company going, this guy went for two years without drawing a salary. Then, 2008, after eight years, the global financial crisis hit. And the venture capitals, uh, the venture capitalists, the VCs uh, behind the company said, hey, sorry, man, we can't keep going. We can't continue. So he had to shut down the company. There was not going to be a NASDAQ listing. Suddenly, he had no job, no income, savings depleted from two years of no salary, and a mortgage to pay, two children in private school, and a third child at five years old about to start school. So, how would you describe his prospect in life? Bright? Dire? If he was your son or your brother or your friend, how would you advise him faced in that situation, facing that situation? If he was a Christian or would you advise him differently? than if he was not a Christian? So these are questions we would need to consider when facing challenges in life. So, How can our faith guide us through these challenges? So we have seen powerful stories of faith and divine sovereignty with Daniel and his friends standing firm amidst exile facing the fiery furnace and the lion's den. So now in Daniel 8, we encounter a slight shift in the story, the storyline. This chapter, written in Hebrews, unlike the, first, the earlier chapters was written in Aramaic, was addressed to, the Jewish, to a Jewish audience. This chapter plunges into apocalyptic vision, preparing us for upcoming trials and challenges. It offers a prophetic message of warning and hope, reminding the Aesthetic Jews of God's sovereignty despite their suffering. This morning, we will explore how this passage of Scripture speaks to the realities of our faith journey today, particularly in the context of suffering and resilience. Many of you uh, are new to this community at Gospel City Church. Only a few of you may know this story. So a few years ago, we had a visitor, 
a high-flying executive who gave us some really candid feedback at the end of service. She said, you guys are too serious. I don't want to come to a church and hear a sermon about suffering. I want to be encouraged and lifted up. While her desire for uplifting messages is understandable, Scottish theologian Sinclair Ferguson cautions against avoiding the reality of suffering in discipleship. He warns, let me read verbatim, beware of anything purporting to be biblical Christianity that does not emphasize the necessity of Christ's sacrifice for our forgiveness of Christ's sacrifice for our forgiveness, or teaches a style of discipleship that avoids the daily bearing of the cross. Such teaching does not come from above, but from below. Incidentally, Massimo met Sinclair Ferguson a few weeks ago at a preaching conference in the US. He shared a photo with the preaching team which led me down a rabbit hole uh, to look up Ferguson's uh, published work and sermons. So I found his warning fitting for the message this morning. So you may find this message particularly relevant, especially during times when you feel that everything and everyone is against you. Let us bow. Long intro, let's bow and get our hearts right. Heavenly Father, we come before you with open hearts and minds, ready to receive your word as we continue with the book of Daniel. Remind us of your faithfulness and control. Lord, as we study Daniel chapter 8, we ask for your guidance and wisdom. Illuminate our minds to understand the truth within these passages and soften our hearts to be receptive to your teachings. Father, we seek not just knowledge, but transformation. We ask that through this sermon, you would mold our character, strengthen our faith, and equip us to face the challenges ahead with steadfast hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week, Carl helped us understand apocalyptic literature. He noted that while it proclaims real hope, It also acknowledges the realities of evil regimes throughout history using vivid and often beastly imagery to communicate these threats. Our central theme this morning is that God's people will face opposition, but God will overcome it. We will explore the passages in the passage today in three parts. Chaos ahead, calamity ahead, and confidence in the days ahead. So the preaching team has so far covered each chapter of Daniel sequentially, breaking down the chapters into sections of movements or movements according to the verse flow of each chapter. Today, we will consider Daniel's vision and its interpretations together in chunks, moving around a little bit to grasp the full message. So you won't find neat matching verses in the three parts, so like disjointed slightly. So as we begin, remember that Daniel's vision was meant to prepare God's people for what was to come. As Carl said last week, God uses apocalyptic visions to communicate deeper spiritual truths and future realities that are beyond our physical sight, things we cannot see. These visions help believers see beyond their immediate circumstances, offering a divine perspective on God's unfolding redemptive plan. They assure us that Despite the chaos and calamity ahead, we can have confidence in God's ultimate plan. So let's start with the chaos ahead. This vision occurs during Daniel's exile in Babylon under King Belshazzar, two years 
after the first vision Carl preached on last week. Recall from previous week's messages by a message by Eken, Belshazzar's kingdom received a dire warning from God, interpreted by Daniel himself. But this time, this vision is in Daniel's perspective. So in Daniel's vision, he was transported to Susa, about 200 miles east of Babylon, which is in modern-day Iran. Susa would later become the capital of Persia. The empire would soon overthrow Belshazzar and Babylon. Daniel, who had been hoping for his people's imminent return from exile back to Jerusalem, is now forced to turn his gaze away from Jerusalem and look eastward. What he sees reveals the challenges they would face even after returning home. So Daniel sees a ram with two horns, one larger than the other, charging in all directions, unstoppable. Then a male goat with a single horn attacks the ram, tramples it, and becomes great. The goat's horn breaks off and is replaced by four others. By now we know that apocalyptic literature that often uses complex symbols, but in this vision, we have a straightforward explanation. We don't need to guess what they mean. Because, as Hwajie read, in Daniel 8, chapter 8, verse 20 to 22, the angel Gabriel explains the vision. The ram represents the kings of Media and Persia. And the goat represents the king of Greece. The great horn is the first king of Greece. And the four horns are the four kingdoms that arise after his demise. So unlike the broad scope of Daniel 7 from last week, which spans from Daniel's time uh, all the way to Christ's victory, we are about him, the Ancient of Days, and, and ruling over all eternity, beyond and forever, this vision today in Daniel 8 zooms in on a very specific historical period spanning only about 400 years. Babylon, Media Persia, Greece. So about 400 years of history. Historically, about a decade or so after this vision, the Middle Persian Empire conquered Babylon, allowing the Jews to return home under King Cyrus. Yet, life under the Middle Persian rule was challenging. For those of you who recall our series on Ezra and Nehemiah, they went back to Jerusalem, but life was still challenging. Similarly, in our lives, we might pray for and receive answered prayers, but new challenges can arise. So how can we stay faithful in such times? Question without answer. Let's listen on. The goat in the vision represents Greece, where the horn symbolizes, symbolizing Alexander the Great, who conquered the Middle Persian Empire about 200 years later. Middle Persian ruled for 200 years, and then Alexander took over 200 years after, the, uh, after they took the fall of Babylon. Alexander's death led to the division of his empire into four parts. The, and God's people remained under foreign rule. So Daniel's vision so, shows that these powerful kingdoms are ultimately under God's authority. The terrifying images of mutant creatures with wings and horns that we heard of last week are reduced this week to mere sheep, male goat. A male, a male sheep is a ram, a ram is a sheep, and goats. So from beastly, mutant, scary beasts down to pretty domesticated goats and sheep. Their presence in the vision signifies real chaos, 
but they are not the main characters of this, or the central plot of the vision. So Carl reminded us, don't worry about the, who, what the images and who they are. There is a bigger plot behind the storyline. So re- despite the threats conveyed through the image of this beast and the animals, we must remember that as Daniel did, that God controls all history. We look to Psalm 146, verse 3 and 4. I'll read to you. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Daniel sees chaotic days ahead for God's people. Now, he has to prepare them in his vision, as he wrote, for what lies ahead after their exile in Babylon ends, when they're back in Jerusalem. So the next part of the vision reveals not just general turmoil and chaos, but particular calamities that will test their faith and resilience. The calamity ahead. We move on. After seeing the vision of the ram and the goat, Daniel witnesses something even more disturbing. In verse 9, a little horn growing from one of the four horns becoming exceedingly great toward the south, east, and the promised land, and that God's people would return to it in about a decade when King Cyrus of Persia comes to power. So it's one thing to know that God's people will be subject to other kings and other kingdoms through the ages, but it's quite another thing to realize that one of these kings will target them specifically. This horn disrupts the worship of God, removes regular burnt offerings, throws truth to the ground, destroys many and makes war on God. Verse 23 identifies this horn as the king of both faiths, widely agreed to be Antiochus IV, the fourth, who rose to power around 175 BC from the Seleucid dynasty. Carl introduced us to this character last week. Unlike his predecessors, Antiochus IV was brutal towards the Jews. He proclaimed himself a god, calling himself Antiochus Epiphanes, which translates to God manifest. Look at me. <laughs> calling, almost considering himself God. The verses in the vision tells you that equivalence. He enacted policies that led to severe persecution. The historical record of Antiochus' tyrannical rule can be found in the work of Shane Cohen, a scholar of Jewish history from Harvard, in his book, From the Maccabees to the Mishnah. This is a Jewish literature, Jewish history. If you're interested, that's the source for what happened during that period uh, when Antiochus ran tyrant in Jerusalem. So when a so the next interesting part, which Carl alluded to last week, but I'll give you a bit of detail. Why? What triggered it? When a rumor spread that Antiochus was killed in war, the Jews rejoiced and attempted to restore a lawful priesthood in the temple, but Antiochus returned. The rumor was not true. He was furious. He looted the temple, massacred 40,000 Jews in three days. He was stopped by Rome in Egypt. He was trying to conquer, but Rome, the Roman Empire, the Roman army stopped him in Egypt. He vented his frustration on the Jews, escalating his brutality. He rededicated the temple to Zeus, we heard. He sacrificed pigs on the altar, prohibited regular sacrifices, banned circumcision and Sabbath observance, and burned copies of the Torah. He commanded pagan sacrifices in every town in Judea. These horrors 
anticipated in Daniel 8, tells of Antiochus' action as a war against heaven itself. Daniel's vision reveals that this persecution is part of a larger conflict involving the powers of darkness. Yet, God is not distant nor detached. I hope this brings some comfort to us. While we don't get the direct answer as to why these horrors befall God's people, we learn that the Lord is actively involved in their plight. Our battle against sin, darkness, and the devil is his battle. Ultimately, evil is defeated and God's people will be vindicated. Verse 25, we are in calamity. Go to verse 25 and we read, By his cunning he shall make the deceit prosper under his hand, and his own mind he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, not, but not by human hand. Even the defeat of Antiochus by a man was the work of a higher authority, God, behind that. This calamity will end not by human hand. God will see to it. So historically, Judas Maccabeus led a successful re rebellion, the Jewish rebellion, after Antiochus' persecution, bringing to a period, historically is recorded as a golden period. Carl said mm, it was golden in the beginning, but turned rotten very, very soon, very rapidly. So, so it's a period where the Jews were able to kick uh, foreign rulers away from Jerusalem. So, but there, chaos, calamity, calamity may end, but if we are caught in the midst of it, where can you find confidence to remain faithful? Personally, how can you be confident and be faithful that your own suffering will end? In verse 28, Oh, sorry, verse 26, Daniel learns what we've been assuming all along, that his vision refers to many days from now. Daniel, when he got the vision, was an older man. He knows his life is nearing the end. He might see his fellow exiles in Babylon return to Judea in about 10 to 15 years. The exile was for 70 years, so the He's in the 50th, 55th year, almost time to go back to Jerusalem. But he will be long gone when this goat comes charging across the land and the little horn rages against God's people. Yet, this is a vision he gets about his people that doesn't really affect him personally. How did he respond? He knew he won't be around. In those days, we, you read verse 27, says, And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business. But I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Is Daniel relieved that these events wouldn't occur in his lifetime? No. It doesn't matter. Is he glad that his friends, children, and their children won't live to see any of this either? We may, but it seems Daniel has a different response. He was sick to his stomach that God's people in any age would face such horrors as prophesied here. So Daniel's heart embraces God's purpose so fully that whether he was personally involved or not, it didn't matter. His concern mirrors Paul's heart when he was distraught and wrote down in Romans those, over those who wouldn't fail to embrace 
Christ. Paul says in Romans 9, verse 2 to 3, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. This was Daniel's approach too. He is grieved at the thought that the people of God would encounter such horrors as he sees in his vision. How would you respond? Let's pause and reflect. Are your heart and mind so focused on God that the prospect of spiritual decline in your family, your church, or your global church grieves you deeply? Take a moment. Think about this. If your answer is no, ask yourself, why not? Write down your thoughts and bring it up in discussion after the sermon. Friends, when we belong to Christ, we also belong to His body. And while that's a great privilege, it should shape our concerns accordingly. Our heart should ache when any part of the body is hurting. After the shock of his visions, Daniel didn't retreat or give up. In verse 27, he said, Then I rose and went about the king's business. Despite glimpsing both the terrors ahead and the future glories, as we learn in the vision in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel continued faithfully in the ordinary task God had called him to do in service to the king who is actually holding them prisoners. In Christ, we have a glorious future awaiting us, and in this world, where the sin and wickedness is not our ultimate hope. Some of you might feel so disheartened by the world's vanity and sin that you withdraw from the very moments and people God has placed in your life. When we don't know We don't know when Christ will come again. And we shouldn't trust those who claim they know. Nor do we know exactly how evil will manifest itself, but we do know that God has called each of us to specific roles in our homes, workplaces, and as members of His body. Rather than being overwhelmed by the uncertainties of the future, we have we are called to find confidence to pursue faithfulness in the present. Embrace your calling as beloved children of God, living out His love and grace in whatever task He sets before you. Your work, no matter how mundane it seems, is significant in God's plan. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of law. He paid the price to free us from the bondage of sin and death. His death and resurrection reconcile us to God, restoring the broken relationship between man and the Creator. He took upon Himself the most extreme suffering, sparing us from the need to go through it. On the cross, He took upon Himself our sins and returned Those who believe in Him receive His righteousness. And those who believe can look forward to an eternal fellowship with our Creator. So lean on Him, find strength in His promises, and continue in the path He has laid out for you. You are valued. We are all valued. We have a purpose. You have a purpose, and you are not alone. Chaos, calamity, and a call to be confident. That's generally what the text is, the way I break it out. But how can we apply these lessons to our lives today? The vision teaches us several points about living as faithful followers of Christ in a world that often opposes us. I propose three applications. First one, not being surprised by trials. Two, to seek spiritual solutions for spiritual problems. 
And finally, to learn to lament with faith. The first application, don't be surprised by trials. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. The visitor I mentioned earlier at the introduction was surprised that we teach and prepare the church for chaos and calamity. Peter exhorts us not to be surprised when we suffer as Christ's followers. After all, we are exiles and strangers in this world. Citizens of the kingdom of God rather than kingdom of man. Why would we expect a better reception than our Lord received? When we face real cause for being disciples of Jesus Christ, we should not be surprised. In many parts of the world, the days are running out when claiming allegiance to Jesus Christ is seen as a virtuous thing. We must recognize this and not expect to gain favor when the world, from the world for being disciples of Christ. While we may not face the awful persecution that Antiochus inflicted on God's people, many Christians around the world do. Even today, Satan works behind the scenes, raising up little horns throughout history to oppose and oppress God's people. We don't have a sacrificial system like Israel did, Antiochus, which Antiochus took away for a time, but Satan still tempts us to embrace versions of Christianity that is, that are, that is devoid of sacrifice. The Christian life is challenging. We don't just float to heaven on a cloud. The cloud is reserved for God. <laughs> we heard from Carl last week. So it's just this idea that we float on a cloud. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> That's a little bit dangerous to think that we can float on a cloud. Think about real life examples. Maybe you face a job loss, experienced some, some serious health issues, or gone through a breakdown of important relationship. These are tough situations. But they are opportunities for God to shape our character and deepen our faith. Massimo, in helping discuss the preparation of this sermon, he says, read, read James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4 for everyone. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. Do not be surprised. There is a purpose, a good purpose that can come out of those trials and suffering. So second application is to seek spiritual solutions for spiritual problems. It's tempting to look for practical answers to problems that are spiritual at its core. For the exiled people of Israel, returning to the promised land was the great hope. All they were hoping for in Babylon, oh, we want to go back to Jerusalem, the temple, to rebuild the temple. But Daniel 8 teaches us that returning to the land would not solve all their fundamental problems. Life in the land was perishable. Worship there was just a type of and shadow of the greater temple to come in Jesus Christ. So the temple in Jerusalem is just a shadow. It's not the end point. So consider this, the Israelites longed to return to their homeland, believing that once they were back, all would be well. But their deeper issues, spiritual disobedience, idolatry, and a heart far from God remained unresolved. Changing their location from Babylon to back to Jerusalem didn't address these core spiritual problems. We too might think, that practical fixes will solve our deepest issues. We might believe that getting past a busy season at work, getting married, or finishing school will bring peace and fulfillment 
we seek. An example to consider, you might be overwhelmed with work, thinking that finishing current project will settle things down. You might believe that getting married will solve loneliness and make you whole. Perhaps you think graduating will finally give you satisfaction and direction. But the book of Daniel, in this particular chapter, invites us to see that many of our problems are actually spiritual and must be addressed spiritually. Finishing a project might just lead you to another one. Perpetuating stress that you, f- you will find your worth it's more stressful than it's worth its work. Marriage might bring companionship, but if your true identity and fulfillment aren't in Christ, it won't make you whole. Graduating might open doors, but without a special a spiritual foundation, postgraduate life can lead to anxiety and confusion. True rest and freedom from sin required the Lord himself to step into human history. Jesus Christ would deal finally with the root problem of sin and evil, offering us rest in the kingdom of God. About 200 years after these events in the vision, Christ, Jesus Christ arrived, breaking the powers of sin and death and offering us true rest. Not in the visible earthly kingdom, but in the kingdom of God, seen by faith now and by sight when Christ returns. Daniel's vision reminds us that true peace and solutions come from seeking God first. We need to recognize that we are facing spiritual problems and turn to spiritual solutions by prayer reading of the scriptures, seeking godly counsel, and relying on the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, the application is that we must look to Jesus, the greater temple, for our answers. In him, we find the true resolution of our deepest, deepest issues. Finally, the third application, something that is not commonly taught, But Chris shared a set of material for me, and I went dig deep into it. I think it's helpful for us. The idea that we are to learn to lament with faith. In verse 13, Daniel hears a conversation between two angels. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering? the transgression that makes desolate and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. The cry of how long is a common biblical lament. We hear in Revelations chapter 6, verse 10, they cry out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, how holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. And in Psalm, many, many verses in Psalm. I choose Psalm 94, verse 3. O Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked exalt? Daniel receives a definitive answer. 2,300 evenings and mornings. But often, we don't get such clear endpoints. When we face the trials of the world, we too may cry out, how long? While we may not see as clearly as Daniel, I want to encourage us that we may actually have a greater clarity through our Lord Jesus. Though we lament the dark days ahead, we do so with hope. The one who sits at the right hand of the Ancient of Days, ruling with all authority, has already triumphed over sin and death. He has fully 
justify us through faith in Christ and will finally break the forces of darkness when He comes again. As Christians, we are not promised a life that is suffering free. This is quoting Massimo. But we are promised that our life is suffering proof. Suffering doesn't break you. A Bible commentator explains suffering and lament. Let me read. This is the, I found the most useful, helpful part. Suffering is the pain. Lament is the response. Suffering is what happens to us. Lament is what we do with it or in it. The conditioned response of most people to suffering, whether their own or someone else's, is to get through it as quickly as possible. Find the bright side. Change the topic. Go shopping. Check off the stages of grief. Start a new life. None of this is lament. And all of it ignores that suffering has any value. What is more, it ignores the fact that not all suffering will end this side of the new Jerusalem. The man acknowledges both. We do well. We would do well for ourselves and for those who love, we, that we love, to learn how to lament well. So brothers and sisters, lament and cry out how long, but do so with faith and confidence. Know that we belong to Christ and through faith alone in Him, we have hope. So remember that guy I told you about in the beginning? 16 years has passed since the story that I saw that paused for a while at the beginning when everything came to an end, what appears to come to an end. That was my story. God has helped me grow my confidence in Him. I have learned to look beyond my immediate struggles and remember that my ultimate rest and hope are found in Jesus Christ. No matter the chaos or calamity I face, I know that God's eternal kingdom is my true and more valuable inheritance. So, back to the question, how would you advise that guy about his prospect? Would it be different if he was a Christian or not? It should make a difference if you know Jesus and your hope is placed on him and your eyes sees beyond what is immediate. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wisdom and guidance found in your word. As we face the trials and challenges of this world, help us to remember Daniel's faithfulness and the ultimate hope we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, we acknowledge our tendency to think we know better than you. Help us to surrender our doubts and lean on your wisdom. We lift up those who are listening now, especially those struggling to place their trust in you. Strengthen their hearts to endure with faith. Grant us and grant them the courage to face each day with the assurance that you are all wise, all good, all loving, just, and you are in control. May we not be surprised by the difficulties we encounter, but instead to look to you and speak and seek spiritual solutions and learn to lament with hope, trusting in your promises. Lord, we hold us fast and keep us steadfast in our journey. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message. We invite you to learn more about Gospel City Church 
at gospelcitychurch.my.